Welcome to Holistic Human Performance Podcast. My name is Jenna Bradshaw, where we talk all things holistic health, wellness, spirituality, fitness, meditation, energetics, and so much more to help you become the healthiest version of yourself. Let's dive in. This is not medical advice. This is simply to help you on your journey through health, fitness, and wellness. I hope this helps. You can complement this with anything that you are doing currently in your life. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Holistic Human Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Jenna Bradshaw, and today we have a very special guest, Dr. Jeff. He is a chiropractor, nutritionist, and coach who is very much immersed, oh, and also author, (laughs) who is very much immersed in the health and wellness industry. He is a force to be reckoned with, and I'm so excited to have him on the show to pick his brain so that all of you can learn. Without further ado, welcome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenna. Pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Yes. I'm excited to see where this goes today. Me too. So <laughs> let's, um, let's your story. And by the way, his book, Timeless Youth is phenomenal, especially anyone who has dealt with, you know, childhood illness, um, much like myself. So I can, I also can resonate with you because mm-hmm. I, I have been a migraine sufferer since I'm oh, like wow. three and a half years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, So I want you to go into, you know, kind of just like brought you to this point of like really examining the question, what is health? What actually is it? So why don't you share your story of how you even got involved in what you're doing today? Awesome. Love to do that. Yeah. So the story starts when I was about six years old and going, going to first grade, all of a sudden you get a little bit of a headache and you come home and, you know, maybe tell mom and dad about it and then just kind of move on. And then the headaches became more frequent. They were coming Mm -hmm. more often. So eventually we do what, you know, what, what I knew to do, what my family knew to do, or my parents at that point knew to do, which is you go to the pediatrician, you go to the pediatrician and, you know, children's Motrin, children's Tylenol, children's aspirin. Um, the only problem is the headaches kept getting worse. So eventually mm. you go back to the pediatrician and then there, eventually it goes on to ibuprofen and then prescription medications. And then after a couple of years, the headaches continued to get worse. So, um, you know, progressively worsening headaches in a child um, that don't respond to pain relievers is, is a red flag symptom. Like, Hey, something bad could be going on in the brain. Right. So eventually got a CT scan. They found a mass in my brain. Didn't know what it was. Got an MRI and, and, uh, turns out it was a, a cyst, a benign mass. So not cancerous. They mm. did about a dozen more MRIs over the next 10 years, found out it's not growing. Um, but I remember meeting with the neurosurgeon when I was about nine years old and he, he was talking about this thing growing in my brain. That's scary. Talk- yeah. You know what? Yeah, it was, but I don't think I was aware of that at the time because right. as he's talking about the possibility of brain surgery, I was thinking, well, I hope they do surgery. <laughs> you know, like that was my level of naivety at that thing, because it's like, right. I was just so trained in the medical system. Like if this, if they say this is the problem and they take it out, you know, it'll, my headaches will be better. And then I can go play basketball with my friends or whatever I wanted to do. Right. What what I would realize over time is well, one is brain surgery is like really serious thing. So thank God I didn't have to do that. Of course. Um, but then the other thing is you start to realize, okay, so this mass in my head never grew, but sometimes the headaches were bad. Sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they throb. Sometimes they pulse. Sometimes they were constant. Sometimes they're on the left side of my head. Sometimes they're on the whole head. Mm. And you start realizing the symptoms were always changing, but what they thought was the cause never changed. So mm. it was like the first little tap on the shoulder, like, hmm, you know, is this really the cause kind of what they're looking at? And then I went through traditional medicine for about another seven to 10 years and um, different drugs, you know, different medications, put me on eyeglasses, you know, all kinds of different things. And you're just, you're just in the wilderness searching for answers. Right. Right. And basically that's what I felt like for, for a while until I found someone who did, you know, through that journey, I found a chiropractor and I was able to get symptomatic relief for the headache. So the headache was at a seven, I got an adjustment. It went down to a four, which was super helpful but it didn't stop them from coming. So Mm -hmm. through that, I eventually got into some holistic nutrition when I was about 13, cut out sugar, cut out dairy, um, was kind of the first step of that process, started rebuilding the body with some good food that helped tremendously. And then the headaches were like 90, 95% better. And then eventually I got into some of the, the stress, the emotional 
the spiritual aspects of healing. And that kind of helped me find more right answers to help me on that final piece. But, and through that journey, changed my major, I actually majored in Spanish in pre-med, um, became a chiropractor, did a focus in nutrition. And uh, now we have a wellness clinic here um, in Texas. So cool. I love that. It's really interesting. And time. the reason why I ask the, um, you know, people that I have on tell your journey, because it's so interesting to me how mm-hmm. there is a pattern with every yeah. single one of you and yeah. including myself, where you had an adversity with your health or some aspect in life, and you chose to take a deeper dive and figure out, yeah. okay, I'm going to navigate. I'm going to find different options. I'm going to find different people. And you kind of have to like unwire and then rewire to say, okay, like there's, you know, it's not just the Western medical field that's going to help me. Like I got to find, and you made a really good point, which I loved in your book about how you went to go see a functional integrative medical doctor. And you were like, even that, like there's another step after that, because some of them will prescribe you like 40 supplements and it's outrageous. And it's a matter of coming back to yourself to say, Hey, like I can heal my, I can heal my body. I I trust it. So I really commend you on writing. When did, when did you publish your book? What year? Uh, early January, January of this year. So just super we're, new. This is May, so we're four months ago, five months, four months ago. Yeah. That's incredible. What made you want to write a book? You know what? Um, I just wanted to get the message out to more people. I mean, that was honestly, it came from this place of like, um, you know, as you're going back to your question, you asked that question, you said, what I was trying to write in that book was what is health and help people rewire their brain around it. And I one is thank you so much for saying that you said it so well, because that's exactly what I was trying to do. I think the biggest, the biggest issue we have is that we don't freaking understand what health is. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem. And to your point about all all of your guests, including myself, including you have incredible stories of how we got here. And you know what, because if any of those pain relievers were worked, I might not be here. Right. Right. If that model of drugs and surgery, which is the medical model would have worked for a lot of people, you wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of millions of people every day going to alternative healthcare practitioners. Right. But the problem is healthcare, the healthcare system, most around the world, especially here in the U S has two problems. One, it has nothing to do with health. Right. And often there's little care in it, right? So it's more of a disease treatment system as, as you know. So it's, so that's, that's the biggest issue. So, and, and what I, and what I saw was, okay, so we call it healthcare, but it's not healthcare. And how do you help someone understand that? Because if not, you're always, ch- always chasing, I see this a lot with my patients and clients, like you're always chasing that next miracle diet, that next supplement that you watched a five minute video for on Facebook or the 30 minute ad on YouTube or whatever the things happen to be, which can be helpful, right? But if we go all the way back to the basics, because you can do one of two things. We can try to eliminate symptoms or we can become healthier. Mm. And if you become healthier, by definition, you're less, less sick. You cannot be sick and healthy at the same time. So we can focus all of our time on, eff- on effort, on getting rid of disease and hiding it and stuffing it in a drawer and covering it up with drugs. Or we can simply day by day, step by step, get healthier. And if we do that, by definition, we're getting less sick. And I just, I know my experience as a child, you have your experience going, going through that. And there's just hundreds of thousands of people going through there. And it just, you know... Do you know someone in this country? Do you know someone in this city? Do you know? And, and there's a lot of great practitioners out there. But I thought the biggest thing people need is just like you said it so well, just rewiring the brain, the mind on what is health. And if we could just change the operating system on what that is, I actually think that's the biggest issue we have in the healthcare model. Yes, because also I've noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed this too, when you try to like coach someone or you're working with your patients, and you kind of have to like take a step back where you're Mm -hmm. like careful almost with your words, because it can be a little bit frightening for the person. And they're like, wait, what you mean? Like, I can't take Tylenol or I can't, you know, and these things are very scary to people. And especially I deal with cancer patients, I deal with survivors and it's kind of like, 
rewiring them where it's like, Hey, um, you don't really need to go get scans every six months. You don't really need that radiation in your body. Like you can go check out thermography. You can go see, you know, a holistic doctor. What about an integrative oncologist? Have you ever heard one of those, you know, those types of things. Um, so I'm really glad that you are number one, your book was great. I, I literally could not put it down. Um, I love how you incorporate history, which I think is really important in your, um, like methodology, your principles, your theories. So do you want to touch a little bit on that, on these, how you basically developed these principles and what you kind of like realized through the discovery of asking yourself one simple question, what is health? Yeah, that's a that's a great way to phrase the question. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what it comes down to is, you know, I'm sure you know, like you, like myself, like like many of the listeners here, if you're in the field or around the field, everyone's got this new magic pill, right? Right. Or there's always the new thing, and there's always the new, the new, the new supplement, the new type of healing, the new whatever. And then there's, you know, there's the studies that, you know, vitamin D in the sun is important for your health. And then you've got studies that say the sun causes cancer. And you're like, how do you make sense of all the nonsense out there? Right. One of the things just real simply, like I go back to is, okay, so how did we survive? I mean, I just look into the past, like for something to be true, it should be true. Now it should have been true 50 years ago or a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. So like, if we talk about sun, okay. So sun causes cancer. Okay. So willing to listen to that idea, but how have we survived on this planet for hundreds of thousands of years? Like with that being true. Without right? sunscreen. Because without sunscreen. We, <laughs> we didn't have copper tone back, you know, a hundred years ago, whenever it was invented. Right. So you start looking at that and what there ends up being is, um, so vitamin D is obviously incredibly important. We know that now, and there's actually a, 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 a set of fatty acids that are natural antagonists to vitamin D. So they balance it out. So as you get more sun, if you have more of these essential fatty acids, you can balance it out. So anyway, I tried this Mm. out. I ran a painting business one summer when I was in college and didn't use sunscreen the entire summer and never burned. And I was outside, you know, his exterior painting. So it was outside 10 to 14 hours a day. So you start trusting this out and then you go, you know, so you go through these principles say, okay, so with the right nutritional, with the right nutrients, you don't burn in the sun because the sun is actually incredibly so the distinction is the sun's actually incredibly helpful. We all yeah. need it. End of story. And there's a lot more to the benefits of sun than vitamin D. Like right. I think that's like the beginning of that story. I think it goes a lot into the energetics of it. And, you know, some of those ideas, there's a gentleman we, named Royal, Royal Rife. Yeah. We worshiped the sun at one point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So the benefits of it, you know, so the vitamin D in a pill is nice, but you know, get out in the sun. So there's tons of benefits from that, but the problem isn't the sun. The problem is when we burn in the sun, Mm -hmm. right? So you just start going through these ideas. So you always think you can look in the past. Like, um, I think it's uh, the quote, I think it's from Churchill. He's like, the farther you see in the past, the the farther, you know, can go back in the past, the farther you can see into the future. Mm -hmm. And I think that idea of like, the idea of kind of back testing things to kind of look at what was true and how could it be true for a while. And that was something I always kind of come back to. And we can talk more about that, how it applies to some of the principles, but I think that is something I always look at because what we call traditional medicine actually has only been around for like a hundred years. This idea of drugs and surgery, this chemical, this chemical drug idea, yeah, maybe 150 years, but it's really only been big in the last hundreds or so years. There's been right. crude surgeries before that, but it's actually the, these, um, to go to your idea of, you know, spirituality or energy and in traditional Chinese medicine, they call it chi and Ayurvedic healing. They call it prana. You know, some people call it a soul or a spirit, or you go through all these native cultures. Almost all of them have a word for this vital animating force that's within it. Well, that's either a heck of a coincidence or a sign. Right. My time to send fall a lot more on us a sign than a heck of a coincidence. Absolutely. So let's, okay. So let's touch on your, let's touch on spirituality first, before we get into the principles, how did you first become familiar or learn about the like human energy system, spirituality, like what even got you into it? Uh, Total accident. (laughs) This is a short answer to that question. So a slightly longer version was I was going to chiropractic school and was incredibly bored. I'm not really a school kind of person. I did well in school, but just always found it just 
dull and boring. So anyway, I'm going to chiropractic school, looking for something else to kind of keep me interested. And I ended up taking, taking a job and doing like a sales position while I was going through school. And through that, I ended up at a seminar and then another sales seminar. And eventually it ended up in a personal development kind of seminar. Mm. So I'm there like sitting in a room and they tell me we're going to do a presence exercise. And they define presence as you, you know, not your physical body, but you, you know, as a spiritual or energetic being, being here now. Mm. And I have so much confusion, ignorance, uncertainty of what's going on as they're talking about this. Like one guy said, like, and I'm like, how big do you feel? And one guy said, I feel the size of a building. And I was like, where the heck am I? That this person feels like, I mean, he's like five, eight, you know, a hundred and whatever pounds. And he's saying he's the size of the building. So it was like, just a couple of days, honestly, of just total confusion and ignorance on my part. But then I remember going back to, and then they asked me for a testimony at the end of the seminar. And I was like, well, I really don't know what happened. But what I said is like, I'll go back out in life and let's just see if life gets better or gets worse. Right. And that's kind of what I told them. So I went back in and I noticed I could study less. My, you know, my grades were becoming more easy, more effortless. I actually had so many clients in the student clinic. I was giving a, giving the clients away to my friends so they can hit the requirements to help them graduate. And, and it's just like, I noticed more harmony in my family. So all of these positive things started happening in my life. So I didn't understand what it was, but, but I was smart enough to know something had happened. Like mm. there was a spark of something there and that kind of launched me on. Um, and that was 14 years ago. That's probably 2009. So that probably launched me on a deep path of study, learning, coaching, training, and, you know, an apprenticeship on how to coach and train others. And I've been doing that for the last 10 or 12 years. So cool. I love that yeah. so much. Yeah. I kind of wish that, I mean, listen, it's all in divine timing, right? Like when I was in, <laughs> when I was in college, I was also very like ignorant to it. Um, grew up in a Catholic family. Like, yep. you know, they would say all these things like, oh, you know, that's against our religion and things like that. And I was like, why? Like, what are you talking about? And I always had this curiosity. And then obviously when I had my health adversity um, as a two-time cancer survivor, I was like, wow. okay, you know, and it's much like what you were saying, where like, there's much more to health than just like exercise and nutrition. Yeah, like there are yeah. other things that make us whole and like, that's the most important part. And so I had this question, what is health and wh what it, what am I doing? What am I not doing really? Sure. Where I can get to this next level. So I'm really glad that you said that because to be honest, I've met Oh, now I think it's changed because I've met a lot of holistic chiropractors, but honestly, I've had met a lot of chiropractors and they're so not about this kind of life. It's just like yeah. crack, crack, crack. Okay, good. See you next week or something like that. And, and, and I was just gonna say, and that's, so I'm going to jump in there. Like, man, that's frustrating for me to hear because the, through all the, the first couple of years of chiropractic school were painful for me. Um, and they're painful for most people, but for me, it was like, I felt they were training us to be a ma bad medical doctor. Yeah, It was so much on diagnosis and treatment of disease and standards of cares and all these sort of stuff, which is incredibly useful to know because, you know, we happen to be primary care physicians, but it wasn't from a vitalistic viewpoint or it wasn't from a viewpoint of health. And right. It was a, a viewpoint of like, I'm not going to be probably as good as a medical doctor at diagnosing X condition because that's not what I want to do, right? I want to focus more on the vitalistic or health side. But I say that to say one of the things that got me through chiropractic school was in we had something a class called chiropractic philosophy, which mm. is just like what is that? And it was basically the founder of chiropractic in you know 1895, and and through the next 20 or 30 years wrote out a series of principles. And basically, one of the key principles of chiropractic is the body is a self-healing, self-regulating organism, and it needs no help, just no interference. So there's very much this like vitalistic idea that runs through chiropractic. Now there's different schools that teach that or don't teach that or different ways of practicing. But this idea that the body can heal itself or we can heal ourselves, right? And we can express that through the body. And they talk about innate intelligence or the wisdom of the body. And they talk about universal intelligence, which some people you know, might have all kinds of different names for, but that's like foundational to chiropractic or at least the philosophy. So anyway, I, I understand what you're saying because I know that in the field but it surprises me because it's, it's, it's really one of the, the bedrocks upon which, you know, the profession was built at least initially. Wow. I'm so surprised. I didn't even know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea of like a vitalistic, you know, you're talking about spirituality or energy or this vitalistic Light, idea, life force energy, whatever exactly. you want to call it. 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. And chiropractic is innate intelligence. Yeah. I use the term life force quite a bit or life force particles, which are pieces of bits and pieces of you and your attention that could get stuck in the past or they could be on the future, mm. kind of where that gets stuck. Um, but that is, that's the foundation of what it is um, or what chiropractic is. And the reason chiropractors adjust the back is because that's where the nerves are, right? So the whole idea of chiropractic is we're not, you know, back doctors or neck doctors or things like that, although it can be incredibly helpful for that, but it's, it's clearing up those ener- energetic flows and, you know, or the nervous flows, which is basically energy at some level, you mm. know, between the brain, between the heart and the organs and the muscles and the legs. So that there's, I say, I say all that to say, there was a lot of alignment between that and kind of where I ended up, although I didn't know it at the time, kind of one of those, you know, amazing divine things that kind of just happened. Um, but there was incredible overlap between that incredible alignment um, in a way I didn't really even realize at the time. That's so cool. I yeah. love that. The fact that you can go back and be like, oh, wow, I had all these breadcrumbs and I didn't yeah. even really know what was going on. And I can resonate with you on school. Yeah. I did not like school, don't like it, but you know, it, it became an essential part of what you're doing today. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Exactly. That's the part I can be grateful for. Yeah, absolutely. So let's go over your your principles, right? So, um, I mean, it was like phenomenal. Like when you had the Titanic in there, I was like, this is genius. This is yeah. so genius. So why don't you why don't you touch on that? Because I think it will really help um, the listeners break down and really ask themselves like, wow, what is health? Like, what am I even doing? So, yeah, yeah, I think that's a great place to start. And so what never made sense to me is there's great doctors. There's great nurses. There's, you know, incredible research. There's incredible technology. And I'm talking about in that traditional allopathic medical system. Right. But the results suck to use a technical term, right? There was a study that, you know, it's very rare to see doctors go on strike. Like it's very Mm -hmm. difficult, but it's happened. And then they, the researchers study what happens when doctors go on strike. There's an example of California in the seventies. There's an example from Israel and New Zealand. And maybe there's six or eight examples throughout history of what happens when doctors go on strike. Mm-hmm. So when, when a doctor goes on strike, um, medical doctors, they can't, you know, they, they, they typically strike from all elective procedures and wellness visits, but they're there for emergency type care. That's kind of how they can actually strike. Cause I mean, it's very difficult but what the what the researchers looked at is what happened to the rates of disease and death when doctors went on strike. And you want to guess what happened? Death went down. Less wow. people died when doctors went on strike. Yeah, which was amazing to me. And you kind of look at that across the across the across time, death rates either stayed the same or went down. They never went up. Right. Mm-hmm. And then you kind of look at there's a guy named um so in the United States, heart disease take kills about 700,000 a year. Cancers give or take 600,000 a year. Um, but a gentleman named Gary Null did a study called Death by Medicine, looking at all the side effects of correctly prescribed drugs and incorrectly prescribed drugs and hospital infections and bed sores and deaths in nursing home. It looked through all the different causes, what are called iatrogenic, caused by the medical system. And it was over a million people a year. So a million people a year. So, oh so, so that's what I was trying to reconcile. How can you have great people great, you know, great technology, great intentions, you know, on some level, but we have a system that's literally killing people more than heart disease and more than cancer, which are the two biggest, biggest killers we have in this country, or, you know, which are now second and third, right? This, and the the only analogy that made sense is the the allopathic medical system is like the Titanic. It Mm. is the biggest, it is the best, but it is sinking. And it's pretty obvious if you look at it from the outside, but some people are still on the deck and the band's still playing. So they're not too worried about it. Right. Right. And, and the biggest problem with the Titanic is they had this incredible tech. They had wireless transmitters. that can go 2000 kilometers, which were the best there. Right. You know, they famously didn't have lifeboats. There's, you know, questions about what happened that took it down because, you know, dozens of other boats were crossing the same waters in the Atlantic that same night and none of them sank. So what was different? And I think the biggest issue with the Titanic was this belief that it couldn't be sunk. So they didn't have the lifeboats, you know, they didn't have the lifeboats they needed famously. They also were going too fast for the conditions. You know, you can go through all of the different factors that were there, but it's ultimately this belief that the thing was unsinkable. Mm. And I, so I wanted to write a book, not about the sinking of the Titanic, not about what's wrong with the medical system, 
um, but rather about what's going to be the lifeboat. In the Titanic's case, it was a boat called the Carpathia that picked up the survivors, 700, and carried them the rest of the way to New York. What's the lifeboat that we need to get us the rest of the way to health? And that's what I try to do with the book. So anyway, that's the analogy I use with the Titanic as we start the book, comparing it to the, to the traditional medical system. Wow, love that. That's really cool. I mean, honestly, it was so eye-opening for me too. I'm like, yes, this is exactly <laughs> what, what people need. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um. So then you go into five other principles, right? And we don't have to go crazy with them, but we have number one, the Yellowstone principle, number two, the Model A principle, three, the quantum principle, four, the Olympic strength principle, and five, the golden U principle. How did you even come up with these principles? Yeah. So, you know, so kind of looking, so one is I try to tr try to make sense of my own healing journey. So, um, you know, I had, had the headaches. I'm in 38 now. So I started, got my first headache roughly, you know, 32 years ago. And then I kind of started to get into this more alternative realm 25 plus years ago. Um, and then, you know, so kind of went through that journey. But also, so I was looking at my own experience and, and then trying, when I read or study something, trying to fit it in, what's true about it? How could it be true? And trying to make sense of conflicting results, like we gave, you know, just gave that example of, you know, vitamin D and the sun and whether it's good or bad, right? And there's all kinds of things like that. And then, you know, seeing, you know, let's call it 50 patients a week over, over time and, you know, being in practice for, for a decade plus, trying to figure out how, why do patients get better? Why do they not get better? And mm. how can I make sense of all of these pieces? So it was just a really deep dive into that. Mm. Um, so that's kind of where they came from. And then, because ultimately it's like, there's a, there's a quote that really resonated with me. It's like, you can teach someone the methods, but if all they know that is the methods, they're forever tied to the person who's telling them the methods. Mm. But they have to understand the principles. They understand the methodology behind it or the thinking behind it then they're free to choose and use it as they want or not want. Um, so that's really what I wanted to do because I wanted to educate more people. I wanted to create a bigger reach. I wanted to help more people. And then I really looked at what do they need? And, you know, there's a lot of value in understanding, you know, the best type of B vitamin supplements or what kind of turmeric is most effective and, you know, how people can, you know, the biohacking and, and things like that. And I read it and I study it and I use some of it and I'm happy to, we could happy to talk about it. But what I wanted to do was even go a level behind that to say, okay, how do we, how can we evaluate those to find out what's works and what's BS? Yeah. How can someone apply it for what's right for them or not? So that's really what I was trying to communicate in the book that, as you say, it rewire the brain around what health is. Because when I looked at that study, I said, the biggest issue is we, and even the people who think they understand about health, right? There's, if you dive deep enough, there's often contradictions, mm. right? You were talking about that earlier and you're, you, you, you to talk about Tylenol with a certain client or things like that. And yeah, we all have, you know, a, a word we use for it is kind of a, a, a precept or a belief or a thought. It's like a preconceived notion on what something is. And those are often incredible blind spots for us. And if we don't know where that blind spot is, we're forever going to be affected of the blind spot until we spot it and can handle it. So yes. that's, it was to address that. That's what I was really trying to do. Absolutely. Now, I'm actually curious. Okay. So, cause I know yeah. a lot of like headache sufferers out yeah. there and those who are suffering from migraine. So you want to talk about how you kind of like flipped that script and started actually like healing yourself um, so that people can actually change their belief and <laughs> realize that, Hey, I don't need to be stuck with this for the rest of my life. Yeah. So, you know, just talking, I'll talk about a little bit my own journey to tell you yeah. what I learned there. And then also, um, you know, how I work that with patients now and kind of, we can get both those things in. So yeah, what I started, um, you know, I, like I said, I did, did really did well in school. I had, uh, um, at its worst, I had a headache for two years. So every moment, every day, oh. nonstop for two years, and this was throughout high school. So, um, you know, despite that, I, you know, I graduated as valedictorian or one of, there was a couple in the class. So it's like, I never let that stop me, but that was kind of like my level of drive. And I say that to say, if you would have asked me if I was stressed, I would have said no. Um, but I definitely have a type of personality that when I get into something, I'm well ready to go for it. So I probably wasn't fully aware. 
mm. of all that was going on at the time. But what ended up what ended up working when I so I saw a chiropractor who did some uh, did some what's called muscle testing or some individual nutritional analysis kind of with me. And one of the first supplements I was taking were specific whole food supplements to actually help rebuild my body and specifically the heart. Mm. So what I find, um, so just jumping forward. So the stress of life happened to be hitting me in that organ, right? And Mm. that could be emotional stress. That could be environmental stress. That could be literally just physical stress, but the weak point in the chain, we think of all of our organs has changed, right? Which one is going to break for me? It was, you know, from an energetic perspective, if I would have gone, if I would have gone to, you know, they got an EKG, I wouldn't have had a heart disease or a heart attack per se, but that's right. where stress was showing up in my body. And then for me, that as, as I rebuilt the heart specifically with some whole food nutrition, the headaches got better. So that was kind of the cause and effect piece. Right. Um, so I say that to say now, when I look at, when I work with patients who have headaches, um, one, I feel fortunate that I went through that for all those years, because I happen to know that symptom better than any other, probably like you with, you know, with cancer patients, like you've been through yeah. it twice. It's like, you can, you can see that road and you can have incredible empathy and understanding right. of what they're going through. So four main organ systems that I work, that I, that I check or work with on somebody who's got headaches is, um, heart, thyroid, adrenals, or brain. So mm. heart generally I'm talking about heart or cardiovascular in general. So heart or blood flow, um, and then adrenals has a lot to do with stress. Sometimes thyroid can be involved. Um, and then kind of brain through that. Sometimes you can get into, you know, sinuses and, and things like that. I mean, but the interesting thing about headaches is if you have, and I have a headache, it's probably for a different cause. Mm. And if a young girl has one around her cycle, that's a different cause. And if somebody has one, you know, when they're dehydrated, that's a different cause. And if a young athlete has one after a football game or a soccer game where they took a hit to the head, that's a different cause. And a college student has one on a Sunday morning after a late Saturday night, <laughs> that's a different cause. And we can kind of go through all these different causes, but ultimately it's stress on the body. But if I was going to generalize, those are the four organs or systems that I find uh, most effective, most mm. affected um, by that. And if we take one level back to you know, kind of the energetic realm or the spiritual. I'm always curious. One of my really basic rules is every effect has a cause, right? Right. So someone's got a headache and 10 minutes before they didn't have a headache, something changed in those 10 minutes and you got to find out what it was, right? So from a stress perspective, did they get a piece of bad news? Did they talk to someone they weren't aware of? Did an area of fear get triggered for them? right? Did, did something happen to them? But, or did they eat something that triggered that? Or did they work out too hard? Whatever it is, whether it's a physical cause, emotional cause, you know, mental or spiritual cause, if you find that point of change for someone and really go in deep on that, the answer is in there. Mm. You just got to be able to find it. Mm, that's so interesting. So a couple of things came up for me. Yeah. So when I was three and a half, I went through leukemia, oh, went wow. through chemotherapy. Now, my mom, she told me that when I was going through that, I used to get headaches. No, Mm -hmm. no, duh. I was going through (laughs) chemotherapy and all this traumatic stuff. Sure. Um, And then, you know, I did suffer through migraines throughout my, oh my gosh, my whole life, basically. Okay. Um, They're gone now, thankfully. When I really started to take a deeper dive into spirituality and energetics, I realized that number one, my emotions were playing a huge role, but I also realized that at some point where I just like, didn't do the healing work around the trauma of going through cancer when I was three and a half, and then also going through it when I was 20. So I had to go through thyroid surgery, which is interesting because you said thyroid is one of the main organs. Yeah. So that makes sense. And I never did like the healing work around that and the trauma. It was kind of just like push through, push through, sure. push through. So it's interesting, you know, when you say all of these or like everything is like this chain and everything's a link and this is part of holism. It's realizing that every, every thing is connected, mind, body, soul, all the organs, every, <clears throat> excuse me, emotion, even the seasons, Um, but when I started to do the healing work on the emotional component and Mm. then like the trauma, they went away, Yeah, which is really, you know, so it's to, 
to your point, it's really important to know what's going on. You have to know your energy so well that it's like, okay, you go in deep and it's like, all right, what's going on right now? Like, did I just get bad news? What's my emotional stress right now? What's going on? Um, did I eat something? Because that also played a role for me too. So like, um, obviously our food is garbage in America. So like when I went to, I would, um, I think I went to like Mexican one night and they MSG. Yeah. I literally got so sick, projectile vomited. My yeah. whole nervous is everything was just like firing. Yeah. Um, so I know in time I have to be very careful with where I go out to eat. No Chinese food for Jenna. No thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> that's really important that you uh talk about it. I know your story is like going to resonate with so many mm-hmm. people. I see mm-hmm. so many people that suffer from headaches and migraines yes. and in general confusion with health and they don't know where to go and they've seen 10 doctors and, yeah. you know, so I, I'm so glad that you wrote about your journey. I know it's, it's pretty vulnerable, but you yeah. know, it's, it's worth it in the end. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think, I think so. And thank you for saying that. I really appreciate um, that acknowledgement and that enthusiasm. Um, for saying that. And that's the, obviously the intention I wrote it was was for that. Absolutely. I've gone through it. I've learned some things. I've been able to help quite a few patients through sharing that experience as you have. So how can we multiply that effect for kind of good in the world is really what that comes down to. Um, and yeah, because, you know, it's, it's you know, it, um, yeah, so it, it takes work, it takes time and kind of to go through that. So, um, but going in and to connect that back to what you were saying about the stress, the simple example I like to give for stress is stress is like waves in the ocean and your body is like the boat. Mm-hmm. So you can mm-hmm. spend all your time rebuilding the boat during the storm, or you can calm the seas, or you can do both. Right. And I have some patients that don't really care about how rough the waters are. Or it's difficult to confront and that's not where they want to go. Okay. We rebuild the boat. Some mm-hmm. people that want to focus more on calming the seas, right. And handling mm-hmm. the stress. And that's great as well. And some people want to do both, but because I get the question is like, some people say, so you're saying this is all in my head. So I had to look at that for a while. Like, is that what I'm saying? The answer is no. Like it is it having very physical cause. Just like if you have waves battering a boat, eventually you're going to have you know, things break and flooding and damage and maybe some electrical shorts or whatever is going to happen. You're going to have some physical damage to the boat as a result of the waves, right? Just like the body will have physical things malfunctioning as a result of stress. But what we also know is medical textbooks, not me, not crazy people like you and, you know, other people that, you know what I mean? And like crazy people like me and crazy alternative healthcare people. It's like, right. Medical textbooks say 60 to 80% of all diseases caused by stress. Yeah. CDC says 75% of all doctor's visits are caused by stress. So it's like, I had to look in the mirror myself and say, if this is true, and I had enough experience in my own life to say it was true. And I was starting to do that with patients and say, this is true. It's like, I got to change the way I practice. I got to change what I'm studying. I got to change what I know because there's patients I can show you, you know, a 200% increase in emphysema if somebody's under stress. What person goes to a pulmonologist or lung doctor says, I've got emphysema and they go, oh, stress-related. None. Right, and not not to, yeah, exactly. Not to mention cancer, not to mention high blood pressure, not to oh, mention yeah. ulcers, not to mention, you know, intestinal GI disturbance, not to mention any of those other things, which it's there for all of them as well, right? So I, So anyway, that was a real moment I had to look at. One is how can I reconcile those two? Is it stress or is it physical? Mm. How do you reconcile those two? And then how do you, you know, how do I change what I know, what I study and how I help people to try to, you know, recognize that and and help them as best I could. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing, like changing someone's belief system is very Mm -hmm. challenging. And especially with the work that, you know, we, we do, it's like, you can't force it. It's kind of just like here, this is the information. Take a look at it. If you resonate come talk to me. (laughs) Exactly. And that's, and that's, so that's the other reason I wrote the book, right? Here's my experiences. Here's what I found true. Here's kind of what, what, you know, what I found true, right? My my beliefs, my, some of the principles I kind of based my life and based my practice on, and you just kind of put up a tent pole, right? Right. And say, this is kind of what, you know, what I found, what we do here. And then to kind of attract the people who that makes sense to, and they want to work on that level. And then the other people who, you know, want something different, then you happily help them find what they're looking for. 
Right. So that's that's the other thing. One, and, and then on top of that, help me clarify and understand a lot deeper. Oh, I saw this or I saw this. How do those two make sense? Right. You get in that research and learning mode um, to that. But yeah, that was the that was the other piece around that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This was such an amazing conversation. Are there any words of wisdom that you would like to leave the listeners? You know, I think what I'd like to do is just, I'd like to acknowledge them for being here, for listening to your show, um, for studying, for trying, for, you know, reaching for right answers, reaching for knowledge, reaching to get better, reaching to improve their health. And I just want to acknowledge them and appreciate them for that and just thank them for their time reaching here. And, you know, if we can connect more and help them more, happy to do that, but just want to tell them just to keep going wherever they are on that wellness journey, just keep going because, you know, I like to, like I said, at the beginning, health and disease, you can focus on getting rid of disease. You can focus on creating health, but as you create health, by definition, you're moving further away from disease. Another analogy I think makes a lot of sense is disease is like darkness and health is light. You don't get rid of disease or darkness by fighting to get rid of the darkness. You get rid of it by turning on the light. Mm. And I think that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to do with this book. That's what I'm trying to hope to communicate through this podcast. And I think that's a lot of what you're about as well is helping people turn on those light switches to find a bit of truth, to unlock their own health and just to create the best life they can. So I just like to tell them, keep going. Thanks for being here. And thanks for, you know, including, uh, including me on part of that journey with them. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have you on. Oh, you are um, welcome. My pleasure. Yes. So where can people find you? Good. So the, probably the best place to find me, you can find me on Instagram and it's Jeff Crippen, my name, J-E-F-F-C-R-I-P-P-E-N. You can type that in there and you can find out more about what we have going on. And we've got, yeah, post some cool stuff on there, some recipes, some um, nutrients, some, some studies that catch my attention, some things like that. You can show up on there. Um, and then outside of that, um, love them to check out the book. It was just called, if that's resonating with them, that's some knowledge they want, or they got someone else in their life. Um, because I wrote the book for basically for me when I was six, although at that point it would have been for my parents, right? I write the book for the, the woman who's got an autoimmune disorder or chronic fatigue or tired, and they've been to the medical doctor and the doctor looks at them and says, all your lab work's normal. Um, there's nothing we can do or see you in a year or here's an antidepressant. And you know, deep down that that's not right, but you feel at a loss to find out who actually can help you with that. Those are the people I wrote this for because um, so many of us are struggling with those right answers like I did for years. And if I can write a book to help one person avoid some of that struggle and some of that heartache and some of those wrong answers, that's what I did. So the book is Timeless Youth. Why? Yeah. And it's all healing begins with you. The number one truth in your health is you. So it's all about how you can lock that, rewire that brain and create that health uh, that you deserve. And, and that actually is hundred percent your natural state. I love that. Thank you. So guys, if you like this episode, also check out timeless youth. It is phenomenal. I highly 10 out of 10 read highly <laughs> recommend. They can find it on Amazon, right? You can, yeah. So I should probably tell them that Yeah, you can find it on Amazon. You can find that any bookstore, uh, if they don't, if they don't have it, if you want to support your local bookstore, they they don't have it. They can order it. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, pretty much anywhere uh, books are sold. It, you can get it through there. Beautiful. Thank you. So guys, if you like this episode, like, share, subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.